Crossroads Media. So now that, you know, things have cooled off a little bit, you know, really excited about Simmons getting traded and stuff like that. I mean, there are some concerns that I have with the whole Embiid Harden pairing. And I saw this crazy stat. Apparently, like, uh, Embiid has the fourth highest usage in the last 25 years. And the only player that has a higher usage is James Harden. So, I mean, with that, and then plus the emergence of Tyrese Maxey, I mean, how do you see, like, this, like, who makes the biggest sacrifice in this new dynamic? Who sort of, like, changes their game completely? Because, I mean, I know, you know, James Harden at one point averaged 36 points a game, but that was because he got to dribble the ball for about 20 seconds out of the shot clock every time down the floor, right? Whereas now with Embiid, you know, pretty much he's like our point center. Everything, the sun rises and falls with him, you know, so... I mean, how do you, how who do you see making the biggest sacrifice? And then I mean, with Tyrese Maxey too, he had the dimension that very few teams in the league have with his speed going downhill. You know, does he just become a spot up shooter now, or does he like how, who do you see making the biggest sacrifice in, in all this? Yeah, I think that's a great new pairing. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, and I will answer that right now. Thank you so much for calling in. I really do appreciate that. Now, when you look at his previous seasons, James Harden, that is, because my answer is going to be James Harden. I think James Harden makes a little bit more of an adjustment, but, you know, both of those circumstances were different. When you think about the teams that they were on without one another, Joel Embiid with this team right now, Seth Curry, Andre Drummond before the trade happened, and Matisse Thibault and Maxi, the usage rate is high because because it needs to be insanely high. And it should still be high with James Harden here, but when you look at the supporting cast, there's a reason it was or is as obnoxious as it is. Same with James Harden in previous teams and in previous destinations. It made sense that his usage rate was very high based off of what he was surrounded with and him being being the top dog. So in his previous seasons, where he averaged 34 points per game, 36 points per game, it was about seven assists per game too. Now the scoring is down, but the assist numbers are up. The last couple of spots he was at in his career, 25 points, 10.5 assists per game. 24 points, 10.9 assists per game in Brooklyn. That was this season, or excuse me, that was last season. He almost averaged 11 assists per game. So that shows me that when he's playing in a different area and he's playing with different teammates and he's playing with the different personnel, getting the guys involved and playing a different brand of basketball, which is passing the rock and definitely finding his teammates and being more of a floor general, which if you were in yesterday's stream and chat, that somehow got people all crazy because apparently there's only two floor generals. That phrase, there's only two floor generals in the history of basketball. And that was what Steve Nash and Chris Paul. If you if you call James Harden a floor general, apparently that's a crime and you should be thrown into jail, which is absurd considering floor general just means your primary ball handler who sets up your offense and gets everyone where they needs to be. But my point is, you know, we have this fixation on James Harden, the let's dribble a bunch of times and take a step back three. And he did do that at one point in his career and he scored a lot of points. But if you look at how he has been playing since that 34 point per game season back in, what was that? 2019, 2020, way more assists and less scoring. So that shows me that he's not incapable of doing that. And he's not dumb. He's not not aware of what this situation here is in Philadelphia. He sees what Tyrese Maxey is. He's on the bench getting all fired up and pumped up and seeing the trajectory of who this kid can grow into. He sees the way Joel Embiid's playing. His number one goal is to go win a championship. He has that same demeanor and the same mindset that Joel Embiid has right now. And the and the, the focus is, I need that Larry O'Brien trophy. Well, there's a reason why he's excited to be here. It's the fact that Joel Embiid is on this tear and he's playing at an MVP rate. So he's not going to want to take away from the monster that Joel Embiid is because that then lessens their opportunity to grab the ultimate goal, which they want so badly, both of them, They can't sleep at night because they want it that badly. That's what their focus level is. So to me, I think the answer is James Harden sacrifices a bit more on everything. And that doesn't mean Joel Embiid doesn't. Joel Embiid does too. There's going to be post-up touches that 
aren't going to go to Joel Embiid. That James Harden cooks the three, and he has a step back three. He's got a wide open look, and he takes it. Or maybe Danny Green or Tobias Harris gets a nice bucket that would have maybe in years past or in games past this season would have went to Embiid, and he would have drew a foul, and he would have went to the charity stripe, and a double team would have came his way. He would have shot through it, but his elbow got hurt or hit. And he goes to the line and he takes some free throws. Yeah, there's going to be possessions that don't go into the paint that would have went in the paint. But if it is countered by, okay, now Joel didn't get it, but James Harden hit a three. Or James Harden got Tobias Harris a wide open look in the corner and he drilled it. Or Maxi got the ball somehow instead and he gets a floater as he's going to the basket with that speed that he does. And he got, he got a step on a defender and he can lay it up off the glass, kiss it off the glass and it goes in. Okay, maybe Joel does lose a possession, but they score anyway. And does Joel Embiid give a damn if Furkan Korkmaz hits the bucket, if James Harden hits the bucket, or if he hits the bucket? Absolutely not, because the main focus is the Larry O'Brien. So I think that's how I look at it as a whole and who would take the back seat with the air quotes. But it's not really a back seat. It's just who's going to still be the alpha and still be the number one and still be the guy when thinking of the usage rate? Well, one guy's a center and one guy's a point guard. So in terms of getting up the floor, and I still think Joel Embiid does that. That's not going to change. You'll still see point center Joel Embiid. You'll still see the guy full speed, grab a rebound, dribble up the floor, and then just attack the paint at will. That's a part of this team's offense now. And when you're a defender and you're defending, good luck, right? I mean, here's this seven foot two individual who's about the Euro step on my ass or dunk all over me, or it's James Harden, or it's Tyrese Maxey with the speed. They have so many different angles and so many different uh, players with versatility. They bring different things to their skill set. So Embiid's the big body doing it. James Harden is James Harden. Enough is said about James Harden when you just say the name James Harden. And then Maxi with the speed and the burst. So depending on who's carrying the rock up the floor as a defensive team, you got to think about a lot, a lot, and what they can do compared to the other. And it definitely can change your thought process when you're defending on the other side. Why are you so confident in James Harden's playoff performance and Doc Rivers' coaching ability to make adjustments in the playoffs? Because the last five years, I haven't seen any of, the, any of it work. Yeah, so with Doc Rivers, I think that's fair. I'm definitely more cautious on the Doc Rivers side compared to the James Harden side. And when it comes to James Harden, so to, to answer your question about Doc is – I think all head coaches have flaws, except for Greg Popovich and Eric Spolster. Those are the two guys that wow you to death if you're looking at NBA coaches. But other coaches, they all have their own flaws. They all have those internal problems. The difference is the NBA superstars go ball out and they make up for the deficiencies of the head coach. So I feel if Harden and Embiid can carry their way, you can see issues with Doc, but your superstar talent elevates you over the flaws of the head coach. So with that, why do I feel good about James Harden? Because I look at playoff losses differently than others. So Ben Simmons is an outlier because the guy didn't shoot a basketball, and that's hard to relate and compare to anybody else out there. But we can all agree that Michael Jordan is the best basketball player to ever live, or one or two, depending if you're a LeBron guy. My point is that Michael Jordan lost and lost and lost and lost in the playoffs because losing in the playoffs happens to every great player. Losing in the playoffs is something that makes you motivated to get to that level. Joel Embiid lost and lost and lost and lost. And now James Harden isn't that number one guy from five years ago and having to carry a team without a center and playing with stretch five minutes. And by the way, when they did lose, they lost to a Golden State Warriors team that's iconic and one of the most stacked franchises we've seen over the history of the NBA. And who knows if they didn't have to go up against, like, there's how many people did Michael Jordan stop from winning a championship? It's the same mentality with that Golden State Warriors run, which they could have stopped a fantastic Hall of Famer from winning a championship that doesn't mean that James Harden is incapable of doing it. It just means it hasn't happened yet. So that's why I feel a little bit differently than just saying, well, he's never won before, so there's no way he can ever. No, he has the skill level to do it. It's just that difficult to do it and team him up with an Embiid, and now he's a second option compared to a first. So that's my thoughts. Now, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think that you're forgetting the fact that, yes, that Harden lost to Golden State, 
but he also lost the Spurs. Had 10 points that game. He has multiple playoff performance for shooting two for 13. Did he play with Joel Embiid Mahomes then, though? He didn't play with Joel Embiid, but he played with Chris Paul. They okay. had a shot of winning. Yeah, so he had he had he has had some bad moments in the playoffs. But does that mean every playoff moment for the rest of time is going to be pathetic and awful? But every playoff he has had, he's had a bad moment. Every playoff he's ever played. Maybe, he's okay, a, every a player you could say that about anyone though. I mean, Steph Curry has had a bad playoff moment. Kevin Durant has had a bad playoff game. LeBron James has had bad playoff moments. I mean, to act the to act as if the guy had to be legitimately perfect and never make a mistake in his So let me ask you this. You don't want James Harden, or is this bad that the Sixers have James Harden? Are they in a worse no, spot? No, I, think, I think no, no, no. I think you're way better off because Ben wasn't playing, so you can't be worse than someone that's not, that's not playing. Right. Okay, and look, I, 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 under, I understand bringing up history because I'm a big track record guy, and thank you. That's actually a very good call, and I embrace someone bringing the other side so we can have that conversation in the back and forth. But for me, it's, okay, well, he failed here, then, this, that, that. Okay, but this is a whole different experience. This is a totally different team in a totally different conference with a totally different group of players, and you're now matched up with the Joel Embiid who's playing at the top, 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 top tier of the game and arguably the best player in the entire game right now, which changes the the, the dialogue and the entire conversation. So if you want to bring up the failures of James Harden, you're not wrong to say that he has failed in the past. But my counter argument would be, Every great player has failed in the past before they succeeded. That doesn't mean they will absolutely succeed, and it's a no-brainer, but to act as if just because they lost and failed before that they can never succeed, and I can't feel optimistic knowing that that talent is special and that talent is great, and that's the type of talent that does win championships. There's a lot of great talent that can win titles but never do, whether it's because they're going up against an iconic group or they just they, they have bad games, but that doesn't mean that that player can't do it. It's just they didn't do it. That That's different. The potential, having the talent to potentially win a title is what I can ask for as a fan analyzing my franchise. Putting together something that can legitimately compete for an NBA title, having the talent to potentially do it. Now, of course, they have to execute well and accomplish their goal by doing so, but the talent of James Harden with or without ever doing it can do it. So having that on my team, that's all I can ask for from a fan. 